Good evening. I will call the meeting to order. Jessica, do you want to run through attendance roll? I think yes. we have to also have do I a do vote this? to do a virtual meeting. Okay. And I move that we meet virtually. Thank you. In accordance with the governor's orders. <laughs> so I second the motion. And I think we need a roll call on this. A roll call. Um, Chair Olds Fry. Aye. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Ohanian. Aye. Okay. Amanda. Aye. Okay. Council Member Reed. Aye. Okay. And Council Member Burns. Aye. Perfect. Thanks. Perfect. And we um, have a quorum present. We will. Um, go to our third agenda item, which we will... Jessica, did you wanna do an announcement now? Yes, I did. Thank you so much. Uh, committee members, I apologize. Um, somehow a draft of the um, February 10th minutes got picked up in the packet. This was not at all the final version of the minutes, so I apologize. I would like and I realized it too late to change the packet. Um, so I would like to pull those minutes because they are not the finalized minutes, they are a draft version. They are very wrong. Um, so if we could please uh, skip over the meeting minutes for February 10th, um, the committee could approve or could discuss the meeting minutes from the special meeting on February 18th. I apologize, I'll have, February 10th meeting minutes for approval at our next meeting and in our next packet. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll move approval of the minutes from the 18th. If those are, if that's what you said, those are prepared. Thank you. Perfect. Do I have a second? A second. The oh, approval thank of you. the minutes. And actually, Jessica, point of clarification, I was not at the February 18th special meeting. Can I vote to approve the minutes as we go through or do I just abstain? No, you can vote. Perfect, thank oh, you. Sorry. sorry to answer, Jessica, but yeah. No, I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, Chair Ellsbury. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Ohanian. Aye. Okay. Amanda. Aye. Thank you. Council Member Reed. Aye. Perfect, Council Member Burns. Aye. Uh, Thank you. All right, wonderful. We'll be keep moving along. We will adopt the February 10th meeting minutes at our next meeting. We're going to start with our first period of public comment um, prior to further discussion. And we want to, um, is there anybody indicating that they would like to make a public comment? But if you would like to please virtually raise your hand. No hands raised, so. Wonderful. Then we will go to our next agenda item, which is the special meeting updates. And I believe we have a, We have a staff report first on, or an overview, Jessica? Or... So uh, I do. At the special meeting, um, there were several items discussed. And I, if you can bear with me, I have a slides to present. Thank you. Okay. So at the special uh, meeting, members discussed um, the support services uh, initially. Uh, three support services were identified by agencies, both in sort of town hall, hall meetings with the agencies, and then again through the report submitted in Zoom grants. Um, those services include counseling, uh, individual and group counseling, um, psychiatric services, and diagnostic services. Um, so 
this is the time for the committee to discuss these services and whether there is interest in pursuing either um, RFPs or fee for service agreements for one, two, or all three of these services. Um, participants at the special meeting uh, showed an interest in, in pursuing all three, but we do need um, a committee recommendation and vote. And Jessica, diagnostic services, could you provide, um, that feels like a very broad um, overview? Yeah, yes. Uh, specifically for diagnostic services, what were they looking for? Sure. So um, oftentimes, in order to be eligible for deeper services within an agency, and I'll use Trilogy uh, because I know that representatives from Trilogy are hanging out uh, as attendees in the meeting. So if I get anything wrong, hopefully they can offer advice. Um, but in order to be eligible for deeper um, counseling or therapeutic services, uh, participants first need a mental health diagnosis. Um, so if um, participants are receiving services from Connections for the Homeless, let's say, and Connections staff or Connections case managers believe that um, there might be a mental health diagnosis, but they are not sure. Um, the first step would be for that individual to receive a diagnosis from, from uh, that type of service provider. And, and that diagnosis makes people eligible for additional services. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. So if it's all right, I'm gonna stop sharing and leave it open to the committee for, for some discussion. Yes. And if any of the members of the working group subcommittee want to weigh in on the discussion, I think that would be, be very helpful. I mean, I heard certainly part of it and I remember discussion about all three being important um, and um, um, Oh, I see a uh, helpful note. The better way to say it would be assessment services rather than di uh, yeah, than diagnostic. So maybe we should change that term. But um, we were discussing, you know, okay, we don't really, I don't think we have a really, really good handle on exactly numbers for any one. So it doesn't mean that there is one that we could prove is absolutely more highly needed. But um, we really want to make sure that we are pursuing the things that the committee wants us to pursue. And also um, one possibility would be to, even if we want to do all three, to perhaps sequence them because um, Jessica has been doing a, a quite a bit of looking into what considerations we have in, try, in terms of developing fee-for-services agreements. And all of you who are practitioners probably know this way better than we do and we want uh, this is where we would like guidance and help on um, how we might either construct an RFP or the elements that would go into a fee-for-services agreement for these different services, because that is not something that Jessica and I feel we have the knowledge to be able to do without uh, guidance from people who actually work in the field and know how these are done. Uh, Councilman Burns. Uh, and I know this is a period where we're, it's, it's open for feedback, but I just wanted to be clear. I'm, I'm reading the, the packet right. Um, after the discussion, the, the recommendation is that we create a working group to help with these, the next phase. Okay. Correct. I think Demita would, I should, I don't want to volunteer her, but she would be a good person for the working group. I don't know if she's on yet, but. She's not on yet, but I agree. All right. And, and was there um, thought process between the fee-for-service approach or the RFP 
approach? So we could discuss that if that would be helpful. I'm sorry, Amanda, did you? Oh, I was just going to talk about that or the, you know, some of the things that we discussed, but um, I think the question was around, you know, there's a limited amount of money and there's the three sort of large, um, you know, categories that were indicated by the agencies. So we kind of thought, you know, we weren't sure how, you know, should we focus on one or two or all three? Um, if we did, would we want to sort of start with seeing if there, if any of current agencies um, around town could expand their capacity? But we also know that that's part of the problem is that wait lists are long and that capacity, you know, might be full. And that's why we sort of talked about having um, doing an RFP for it. We also talked about having um, and maybe a criteria in that would be having an agency that's willing to um, offer on site services, you know, maybe in the city of Evanston building or somewhere else so that transportation isn't an issue. We also talked about um, in terms of the fee for service, you know, maybe uh, looking into some telehealth agencies so that access could also be um, readily available. Also choice in terms of, um, you know, making a match with providers. Um, so those were some of the things that we talked about and, you know, we were just putting things on the table, but those were some of the items that we discussed. Perfect. Thank you so much, Amanda. And I think the thought of, um, I like uh, for on-site, I like that concept and then obviously telehealth has that availability and I think we've really seen um, through the past two years uh, a real um, significant uptake in telehealth and satisfaction especially when and and mem or patient um, patient satisfaction uh, in that especially for uh, behavioral health both mental health and uh, substance use disorder treatment and um, we do have a comment uh, about the easiest, um, the easiest way to do this would be to reimburse Medicaid rates for those in need of services that are unfunded. And I do think that's something that we've also previously talked about, um, about uh, though, you know, providing funds for those that are services that are unfunded, um, not necessarily funding uh, when there's other another funding source like Medicaid or something along those lines. We want to, we have a limited pool of resources here in Evanston. We want to make sure that we are efficient um, and, and ex, you know, expanding services in that manner. All right. And other discussion on this? So then the next item would be a recommendation to form a working group on this topic? Well, if I may, would the committee like to vote to agree um, whether we want to pursue one, two, or all three of the um, suggested services? And maybe not, maybe we form the working group first the working group considers uh, components of either an RFP or a fee-for-service agreement. Um, I do have a couple of slides um, with more detailed information than uh, what was provided in the packet just for consideration. Um, if it would be helpful to go over um, that information first to let the committee think about it, I would be happy to do that and then we can kind of revisit. Okay, that sounds okay. great. Fantastic. And once again, bear with me. Okay, so um, you know some components of the basic fee for service agreements were included in the packet, but um, as professionals in the field know, mental health services uh, are are unique. Um, and so other things that could, the working group could consider would be like the duration of the session, how long would each session last, um, whether it would, the sessions could be in person or over the phone or the telehealth option that uh, Amanda discussed. Um, and then any additional services that again would be incorporated into the fee-for-service agreement. 
Um, so preparing records or um, clinical review, summary consultation with other professionals, these are typically um, services that take up a lot of time and are part of the um, main service, but that aren't covered. Those the hours spent doing those more administrative tasks, if I can say that, um, aren't covered. So when we consider um, like the, the Medicaid reimbursement, um, that's typically for the therapy session or the counseling session, um, but not for, for these additional services. So how would we wanna factor that in? And then again, any what would we do about canceled or missed appointments or contact between appointments if um, participants are contacting their, their providers? Um, some mental health uh, fee-for-service agreements do include a court time clause. I don't know how that would affect um, assessment services or diagnostic services, um, or if those that would need to be a component of um, counseling, or if that would only be a component, or if that would only be a component in counseling, and but not necessarily a component um, in psychiatric services or, or assessment services. Um, and then we would hope that the fee-for-service agreement would potentially flush out some of the client rights and, and uh, the client roles. Um, so we'd wanna look at grievance policies, for example, client sobriety expectations, confidentialities, goals of service. Um, and these lists are not exhaustive, which is why um, we would appreciate input from from professionals in the field, whether it's from committee members or um, others. Staff has certainly done some, some research into this, but uh, again, it's not exhaustive. So oh, the request for, I'm sorry, was there a question? Sarah, you had raised your hand. I just wanted to, before we move further on, I wanted to. I did just want to build a little on what Jessica is saying. So Jessica's done, I think a pretty substantial amount of research in this, but this is why a working group we think is so important because these are the types of things that we are hoping that practitioners can say, these are the key ones. And, and one of the things I, we did wanna point out about perhaps providing compensation, compensation for things that Medicaid doesn't cover, like the paperwork that is a pretty major part, at least as we understand it, of people's work, um, you know, there are a lot of practitioners are, uh, practitioners are very busy. And so I think we have to try to make this appealing, perhaps, and, and, and that might be a way of, of helping make it um, something that people would be more willing to take on. Um, just, I'm saying, due to the circumstances of we know there's a shortage of practitioners and that their time is very valuable. So those are the types of things we were trying to figure out. And as I say, we really think that we need help from the experts who are in the field and, and understand the struggles much better than we do. Yeah. Um, some other components um, for a request for proposals that are specific to mental health could include um, defined ex expected deliverables, um, a description of the qualifications we're looking for in professionals who would uh, answer the call, as it were, um, and then perhaps a description of the requested response. Um, so how would the applicant, you know, provide the requested services? What approaches would applicants take to work with um, culturally, socially, and economic economically diverse families? <clears throat> Excuse me. This is also where we perhaps talked about um, an increase um, for practitioners who do um, reflect the cultural background of the people that they're serving. Um, and then a description of how the agencies would ensure continuity of services um, in case uh, practitioners changed or staff changed. So again, not an exhaustive list, but just some things um, for the working group to consider when coming up with um, a draft RFP or, or service agreement. So, so it's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot. And staff is happy to provide, you know, more research, more support. Um, but, but again, for those of you in the field, 
uh, Sarah and I would love to know if we're on the right direction or what, what we're missing. Um, oh, okay. uh, before we move on, we have uh, another question. Uh, Derek. Yeah, thank you. So I just want to make sure that I'm, uh, I'm baselining with the rest of the group here and I understand what everyone else is understanding. So for the fee for service model, the services that would be provided, there would be a, a fee basis based on what is provided and there's different modalities that, that could take place, whether phone or in person or, or telehealth. Is that something that would be then administered by uh, the city itself? That's the one thing I wasn't clear on. Because when I think of requests for proposal on RFPs, I think about an entity like the city putting out a proposal for third party agencies to then pitch, I can do these things for X amount of dollars. So the two sound very distinct. I just didn't, that didn't come across to me in the, in the two slides there, though, which is not meant to be a critique of it. I just want to make sure I understand. Great yeah. question, Derek. Yeah. No, that's fair. Um, so you're absolutely right. They are two very separate <laughs> um, ways of going about uh, getting these services. Um, and, and it would take further explanation because uh, for the RFP, personally, and Sarah, I hope you speak to this. I do. <laughs> I, I think it, um, from an administrative standpoint, it, it would be easier, <laughs> but <laughs> We're happy to, to explore the, the fee-for-service agreement option also. Um, if, if the committee feels like that's gonna get us the services um, we need and our, our participants need. Yeah, and there's a, to the point on fee-for-service and who's administering it, what what is the claims requirements look like? How are you processing that? How are you handling PHI? I mean, there's a lot there. Um, I don't know if we've, handled as a city in that way we we haven't and we might actually if we were doing a fee for services we might need somebody who's an expert to administer it frankly because i don't think that the details of that and and this is the type of stuff we want to hear from you you know i mean this is it's not an area that we are it's not something we do normally we're handling um, a, a, a um, um, response to an RFP, like here's the services and who is, is you know, that's a different, they're going to have their own um, processes for that. That's basically a, a different um, um, process and much less labor intensive. Uh, and and um, I think one of our concerns is we don't want to try to do something as a fee for service that has too much detail that we are not going to be able to um, manage properly and appropriately, and uh, probably is usually handled through electronic systems to track and things that we don't have. So, and the administrative, there's a cost of that, right? Like, and so right. do we want to make sure that the cost is go or the the limited resources we have are going as far as um, right. we can. We don't want to spend it all on, on administrative costs, obviously, yes. yes. Amanda, you had your hand up and then you dropped your hand. Did you mean? Yeah, I think I'm, yeah. Well, I can just say quick. I think um, I think the fee, if I'm remembering correctly, we were kind of thinking about the fee for service around agencies that maybe we already do work with. Maybe, you know, those that applied for the, the social the safety net so that they are established, they do have policies in place, things like that. Um, but the RFP, and I, you know, I don't know enough about the differences myself, but it sounds like, you know, as you were going over the differences, Jessica, you know, the nice thing about that is that you can have some quality control and that people have to be able to prove that they're licensed or that you know they meet certain standards um, and that's sort of built right in but perhaps that could also there could be sort of a hybrid if we ended up going with a fee for service where people have to uh, prove certain things in order to um, and we we did talk about also and maybe this is something where we need to discuss with our agencies who are is, is you can also do a we could develop a fee for service agreement with specific agencies, as you were saying, Amanda, you're absolutely right. We talked about that, where it would be, um, but we wouldn't have that. And I think part of it is depending on the number of people, 
it's hard to say what might be best and it is one of the challenges so we're kind of trying to figure this out maybe it requires um, um, I, I honestly think that if we could pick perhaps a, a, there may also be differences between what would be the most effective method for different services like psychiatric services might be different from and so um, that was why we were thinking well maybe if we could start with one and um, work this out because it's a pretty major thing I think it could have real positive benefits to our people we're trying to help if we can to get this worked out but it is it's a pretty major undertaking and we don't want to enter it and miss something or end up not doing um, an appropriate job and because it is this is medical this is people's health and and uh, you know and it it's very important that we um, have all the proper controls and proper um, things in place to make sure that they're um, you know that confidentiality is retained all the all the types of things that are, are so much part of the of the medical field whether it's mental health or other physical health so um, and probably the this is my guess and practitioners may have difference is um, developing something around the um, assessment services might be one of the because we have organizations that have do that already and have done that and if we can um, that might be a easier to manage first start um, but we also could um, uh, with um, the psychiatric assistance the um, medicine the medication management um, for example um, might be something um, Northwestern I'm excuse me North Shore University Health System um, has a program that is specifically for people without um, that type of without access to that type of help um, as I understand it maybe Jessica you can say a little more about it because something like that a first way of trying to get that service might be more like a subrecipient agreement, at least to start and say, could we arrange with them to have additional time if we were to fund it or something of that nature? So we're really kind of thinking this might have to be a hybrid or, or different methods for different types of services, because I don't know that we would be able to get a private psychiatrist to say, oh, sure, I'm going to have a day or whatever that, you know, I'll be available for whatever you need. I, I don't know the reality or the likelihood of that sort of thing working. So um, there may be different approaches, as I say, for each one of the um, needs that would be more effective. Um, and to a certain extent, if we can figure something out and get started, then we can figure out how to improve it, I think is one of the ways I'm looking at it. You know, we have to start somewhere. Derek, you had your hand up earlier. Yeah, I think I just uh, no. This is helpful. I think setting the context for this is really helpful for me, and it makes me think it, with Amanda's comment as well, where there's a fee for service engagement with existing agencies. And I sort of see three buckets. I see the one bucket is fee for service Evanston. So it's it's essentially we are a startup. We create an agency. Um, within the resources and capacities of the city of Evanston. And then the middle bucket is, is fever service with existing agencies that we contract with and partner with that we assume have the capacity and resources and talent to do what we want to achieve. And then the third bucket is, is we want to throw an RFP out there that says, hey, agencies, can you figure out a way to do something for us uh, based on these outcomes that we're trying to achieve? And then what does that look like? Um, so that, that, that helps me frame the options and then to Sarah, to your point, it sounds like a hybrid is depending on what we're trying to accomplish. And I think, I think, I guess that's my, my last question really for this part of the discussion is, is speaking more specifically, what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve when it comes to providing these, these, these services for people who need them? Yes, Jessica. So 
you know, you, you've summed it up beautifully uh, because yes, it, the process would, I think, be different if the committee wanted to pursue counseling for participants as opposed to assessment services. Um, as Sarah mentioned, we can work with existing partners around medication management um, and, and assessment services, uh, but for counseling uh, and therapeutic services, um, we, we do think maybe perhaps uh, an RFP where we could very specifically define everything we want and then put it out to a broader community would be helpful. Um, so we're gonna push it back to the committee uh, to sort of shake out. Um, do we wanna look at one or two of the options or, or perhaps all three, but in a phased approach? And if that's the case, where, where would the committee like to start? I'll start with some initial thoughts. Um, and I think if I recall, um, part of why we started with support services focusing on mental health services was the need for um, all, it was a collective sort of high priority for all of the agencies um, in both buckets of it, mental health services were needed. And so my instinct is that while assessments are critical, um, if we don't have the actual counseling or like if we can assess somebody and then we can't pass them on to the next piece, or if we already know that somebody has been diagnosed and they don't have access to counseling, um, and that's what we're trying to fill, having another assessment does not fill that gap. So if we can only do one, I would, or we only, or we start with one. My instinct would be to start with the actual Absolutely. services, mm -hmm. um, because assessing and not having somewhere to send them is kind of what we're dealing with right now, right? I mean, that's the problem we're trying to solve, I think. But other, uh, Jessica. I'm sorry. Um, I also wanted to bring it back to our limited pot of money. Um, and so the committee might want to consider um, if we want to set an amount um, or, and again, this is where, because I'm, I'm not a practitioner and I'm not in the industry, I don't know how far um, our dollars are gonna go. That's a, that's a big challenge. I, staff could come back um, and do more research and, and maybe present, um, but that's another thing. Here. I keep on forgetting that I'm on mute. You'd think two years into this that I'd, I have that awareness. Um, yeah, Jessica, I think actually that, uh, that was going to be my next question too, and I think you hit it on the head. Is at, at the risk of my uh, my too much of my business school side coming out here? It's <laughs> it's the, there's an there's an axis. There's the x axis or the y axis, and that's the amount spent and what you get for the amount spent. And I, I just I don't think this meeting will be able to you know effectively determine that. And I think it sounds like more and more that we're talking about this that there needs to be a working group on this. Agreed, Amanda. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, I agree. This more discussion in the work group would be great. Um, but one thing that I think would be really important for this group is to really define who who is eligible. Who are we thinking of as the clients for this? And I mean, I come from a college mental health background where we're all about <laughs> session limits because we have to, you know, um, kind of manage demand. But I, you know, I would be in favor of considering something like that. Like if, as a way to manage the money, like if everyone gets 10 sessions, we can say how much that is. Um, you know, in college mental health, most people don't even use 10. So if people are using like evidence-based treatments, depending on their issues, they, you know, they could get some good help with fewer than 10 sessions. Um, so that might be something for us to consider if we're trying to dole things out in an equitable um, way. It's a, a great call out, Amanda. Um,
And perhaps a way to approach that would be say to, to define the number of sessions and things like that. And, that have, and then because the, these are support services for the people who are in case management is of course the focus of the group. And that would um, probably be something because it's, we could start out on doing, uh, it, you know, I, I honestly think that maybe this could be our best first um, thing to approach from that standpoint. And, and it is something that um, we do have uh, agencies that may very well be able to say, this is what we could, uh, this is what it would cost or what we would need to have this many sessions. And, but it could also, because in a way it could be a fee for service, which could also allow individual practitioners if they were willing to. I mean, I keep remembering Demita talking about how um, they had people who they specifically um, helped and had lower fee schedules for because they didn't have access. And so, you know, there are um, obviously there are a lot of different um, um, ways different practitioners approach um, providing uh, assistance to others, but the, but this could maybe be the best, uh, a really good starting one and focusing on that and then um, moving on to others after that would seem to me to be a sensible approach because I think we, I don't know, but it might depend on who, who is in the working group, maybe uh, different for different group, different one of these, um, you know, people's areas of knowledge might be stronger in some areas than in others, just based on what they're, you know, um, among our, um, committee members, and also if, if we would need to pull in anybody from outside um, for a working group, we can do that if we can, if we need to get expertise on some of this. So maybe that would be a consideration to start with. I think, I think the point that a number of you have made that the gap in people's ability to, to get counseling is, is huge and um, it is a, an immediate need. And maybe this is where immediacy becomes the most important thing. Yes, Jessica. Well, and just to, to provide uh, some, some round numbers, uh, the Illinois fee schedule um, for individual counseling, it's about $29 uh, per, per quarter hour. Um, so without taking into consideration all of the administrative functions that that fee schedule does not address, uh, for one person for 10 sessions, we're looking at about $1,100. Um, so again, I, it would be great if Demita were here. I have a feeling she could <laughs> provide even more information. But if we're roughly rounding up, you know, it, it could be that we're looking at $2,000 or $2,500 for 10 sessions for one participant, if that gives the committee an idea of how far uh, our funds are going to stretch. And again, we know that the, the funds we have are never going to match the demand, um, but just in terms of capacity and, and how much how many people we could potentially serve. If that's yeah, I, I apologize. Just, can you remind us one more time? I, I will one day remember this number, but what was the budget for the? Uh, it's just over two hundred thousand dollars. So it's two hundred and one thousand dollars at four hundred and twelve. Two hundred and one. $1,412. I will say I do recognize also, and I do think we need a working group um, for this. I do recognize obviously that traditional fees, either on the commercial side, on Medicare, on Medicaid, do not cover that admin time um, on at, for any of the payers. I recognize from a practitioner standpoint, that's it would be great. Um, if they did, I think that does add another layer of complexity, especially if we don't have something to model after. Um, and how do you monitor that? Like, is it 15 minutes? You know, like, well, I just will flag that it, it just adds another layer of complexity, um, taking into account that admin time that is very real. Um, but also like, you know, it, it's, I don't know what you would I guess my way of thinking of approaching that would be to ask practitioners kind of what type of time they spent and then how would one value the time and, and saying there would be a flat fee or something. In other words, I don't think it would be something if we were to do that. 
Um, so it might not cover everything and it might not be because I'm sure there's differences between clients and it's not like we're going to turn it into legal billing, you know, I mean, that sort of thing. And, but because you're absolutely right, how would we do that? So I would just, my thought, if we were to try to do that, and I don't know if that would work, would be to somehow come to a, um, you know, a realization. I mean, like when, for example, when when we are setting um, fees for certain things here at the city, like if there is, you know, um, um, or a question about it, we, we try to figure out, you know, if somebody is um, doing an inspection of a property, for example, how long does the average unit take to, you know, we have to try to, some of them take much longer because, you know, so, but we come to something that is sort of the average or whatever we expect or, or, or what we think it might be something that you know, compensating for the full is impossible, but at least just something to sort of sweeten the pot to make people a little more interested in, and in, in maybe is, is something. Amanda, please. I'm gonna say, I think it's it's kind of customary, you know, to charge one hour for one hour, but the the meeting time is 45 or 50 minutes, so that builds in the 10 minutes ah, of your your okay. charging time and things like that. Now, of course, when you have an initial assessment, those sometimes are longer, and there's more to write up. But mm -hmm. usually like for a regular session, it's like 10, 10 minutes or 15 because you, you're meeting with the person for 45 or 50 minutes. Uh, so that's built into the system already in a different way. See, that's why we need to talk to all of you. Um, we got a question. Could the funding be allocated for a position in an agency, i.e. a new therapist instead of a number of sessions? And they had a discussion about that in the mental health task force today. Um, and I think that potentially might be the route an RFP might lead to a solution like that, potentially. I mean, the, the issue, of course, with the, there are benefits and drawbacks of any solution in something like this. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I think we've really, it seems like all are, um, that there's consensus that a working group is needed um, for the, the nuance um, and the uh, complexity of this, the, to further this discussion. Um, do we need a motion to form a working group? Volunteers. Uh, we need no. volunteers. <laughs> I, and we and two members, correct? I that would uh, be ideal, Council but as I say, we could also, if it makes sense, ask out people who are not on the committee uh, who are providers, if if that is a benefit to to or or have knowledge of this could be part of a working we working committees were never required to be only members of the um committee if we could get advice and stuff from outside so but we should form it on the basis of the committee obviously right based on the committee councilman burns yeah that was actually my comment that i'd, I'd um love to see if if uh some of our, our partners from the different agencies would be interested in joining uh that working group uh specifically because it, it were, and correct me if i'm wrong but these services would only be for uh, clients who are um, enrolled in case management at one of our, at one of the agencies, right? Who, who we're our, currently funding. That is my understanding. Yeah, so I, I, yeah so I think this needs, you certainly think we all agree this need, this really should come from what they need, what, you know, the, the need that they're seeing, um, and so, yeah, I would love to make sure we set aside two or three seats for them or however many we need, but I'd love to get some input from them. And and then the last comment is, you know, it's not a lot of, not a lot of money as we know. And so I think I said this during the last meeting that I would love to, I mean, one, you know, I brought up that I'm, the, the, someone brought up the telehealth, which I'm really supportive of, but also the, um, uh, making sure that we can provide the services on site. Those were the two things that I really supported. Um, and so 
no matter what route we take, as long as we can expand uh, services in those areas, I would, you know, personally support it. But, you know, I think the other thing is just trying to figure out, you know, it's, it's not a lot of money. So what are we trying to learn from this? Um, it's something that I, and I can't participate in the working group. I'll be looking for the recommendations that come back, but I would love for the working group to explore that question. You know, we only have a limit about our resources. We're not going to make a huge impact, but we can learn something from this. Um, and that's all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Really great points. So we need volunteers for the working group. Amanda? I'll put a volunteer. Oh, good. I, great. Um, I feel like this. Oh, sorry. No, please go ahead, Derek. I, I think, you know, the question should be asked to the entire committee because we're obviously right now we're five of nine, five of nine, five of eight. I can't remember the exact number, but so I think the question should be asked to the entire. We shouldn't solidify the working group right now, <laughs> is, is, is uh, the point I'm trying to make. Perfect. And I, I agree. And I think what I, I think to that end, um, having another practitioner um, or uh, in a, to join Amanda um, could be helpful. And I'm not one. And I, I do not believe that Derek, you are either. So that, that's right. Um, so we will um, ask staff to, um, con to ask the full committee for volunteers. If I could say. Um, there are several community partners uh, who do work with uh, mental health practitioners. I believe Connections does have a social worker on staff, um, and CNE certainly works with consultants, um, so perhaps representatives from those agencies. Um, and in fact, you know, the social worker or the practitioner from connections would be a great addition. Um, and, and I actually, I think, um, Jessica, that, and to Councilman Burns point, that we should actually, for the working group, um, invite representatives from all of the, um, the agencies that we're partnering with um, for their unique perspectives, their expertise, um, and maybe they don't want to join, but if they do want to join, um, invite them sure and and then um you were correct there is all right so so we can reach out to the full committee and we can also then reach out to um our agencies um and um get a working committee formed um and or get at least people who are willing to be on it and i don't believe we have to have an official approval of who is on it. Um, I don't think there's any reason we would need that, but um, we could certainly do that if you think it's necessary or otherwise we can just sort of maybe email everyone and get to work, hopefully. Does that sound good? Does anybody object to just the email approach on, on the work? Yeah, that, that sounds good. Great. Can I ask, you. is there any interest in um, selecting one category uh, to look into first, or do, do we want to hold a formal vote to, to select all three, but move forward with one first, or that would really help, please. <laughs> it's a, a great, and it would be helpful, I think, to the working group to sort of understand what's the scope they're looking at. Um, Committee members. I just feel like I don't know if we know enough. I mean, I don't know enough. Certainly, this this just this discussion has helped some, but not completely in trying to understand what to cut. Certainly, if we had to choose one, I think we all would know what that would be. But um, I don't know. I, I think I would. You know, if if you're, I don't know if you're saying that would it would be too much for the working group to sort out. But I would hope that they could, we could give this full. Um, assignment to them and they can they can work quickly work through it and make some of those decisions. Um, yeah. 
dare. Sorry, Jessica, the three options that we would consider recommending are in sort of rank ordering for the working group, what would those be? Just to restate it for everybody. Um, sure, it would be uh, counseling services, uh, psychiatric services, and I, I said diagnostic services, but we've heard feedback in the meeting that maybe assessment services is a better way of, of labeling that. Um, okay. okay, thank you. And I'm just uh, heard committee members saying that focusing on the direct services, which to me would be the, I mean, I shouldn't say direct services, but the, well, I guess maybe it is direct services for the people receiving it in terms of getting into service, um, the counseling um, and psychiatric services would probably then take priority over assessment services. I'm just trying to summarize what I'm hearing, not trying to. Yeah, I think if I could, I think counseling as a first priority, but I know, you know, psychiatric services oftentimes goes hand in hand and depending on what's going on for someone could make a really significant difference for them. And then thinking about the folks that we're trying to work with are not um, insured in any way. So you know, it might be difficult for them to get in with their a primary care physician. So it might make sense to do psychiatric, but it also is more expensive and that would kind of, we could serve fewer people. And so, I mean, I think there are probably a number of considerations, but I, I think it was, I think Samantha, you said this earlier and I agree, like maybe if there was one to not do would be the assessment, because there's probably a piece of that just built in anyways. And I don't know if the idea was that the diagnostic assessment was more like a significant assessment like a neuropsychiatry one or you know or if it's just like your intake and sort of you know um you know the general assessment that you would do to figure out treatment plan and things like that but yeah that's a, a good call out amanda and i'm almost wondering if we um and it is something the working group can figure out, but also sort of that connection to perhaps a community provider, perhaps an FQHC or something along those lines that if they can't, you know, counseling, but if they need, um, you know, um, if they need uh, somebody to prescribe or, you know, that there's that sort of like connection to that a potential community partner that, um, that serves those without insurance. Well, maybe all that to say, I think we could probably tackle this in the working group. group though. Yeah. Perfect. So you've got that sort of some initial thoughts from the committee, but we'll have further discussion within the working group. I think we have a chair for the working group. <laughs> well, I hope we just get some more interested people. <laughs> we will. We will get you more interested people. Absolutely. I appreciate your willingness to take this on and we will get more people for you. This was a very robust discussion. I, I just took note of the time, so I'm gonna to try to move us um, yeah. a little through, if, unless anyone objects. Uh, and so then our next item is funding recommendations for applications not eligible under case management or safety net services. Yep, so there were four agencies um, that uh, applied but are not eligible under case management or support services. Um, those agencies are the Job Center, Shore Community Services, um, Trilogy, and uh, Northwest CASA. Um, one of the things that participants of the special meeting discussed that, that I think is important to highlight is that um, all applicants or, or any agency would be able to uh, apply through um, the RFP or um, fee-for-service model that, that we're talking about. Um, but because we, we have these applications open and waiting, um, we, we would like to, and, and open and waiting for 2021 funding, uh, we would like to give them some more information.
Great. And, and so this was discussed at the special meeting. Is there is there further discussion of committee members? I know we talked about this, but I don't remember what we decided. So whatever we decided in that meeting, I'm still supportive of. <laughs> recommendation that the committee vote to formally decline these applicants and allow um, those who are eligible to move forward um, in whatever process come that comes out of the, the working group. That would also leave the door open for impact and any other agency. And in impact was brought up because they had said all along they were not going to apply for either case management or safety net. They were interested in providing support services. So that's why um, Jessica brought that up. So. Thank you. Is there discussion on this? Okay, we'll need a, a motion. I, yeah, I was gonna, I move, uh, so moved. Um, I would need a, a second. A second. Uh, Chair Lindsbrough? Um, I will vote to decline these, um, but highly encourage that they look at the support services as that model and um, moves forward after Amanda's great work in the working group. Okay. My apologies, uh, just to maybe be clear, my, my motion is to, to deny. So a yes vote is a denial for everyone that's coming next. Oh, perfect. And I, I got that right though, correct? Yes, you did, you okay. did, but just so everyone else is clear. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair uh, Ohanian. Aye. Amanda? Aye. Thank you. Council Member Reed? Aye. And Council Member Burns? Aye. Thank you. And we did get a great comment. Um, Jessica, I wanted to flag um, that Oak Park Mental Health Board has a similar fee-for-service type arrangement um, and that they might be a resource. We will get in touch with them. Thank you. And then staff report. Yes. OK. So. Um, Agencies were able to submit outcomes for the 2021 year. Um, those reports are in Zoom grants if people wanted to take a look at them. Um, but uh, in addition to the summary of information included in the packet, I also just wanted to share a quick slide around this. Bear with me, sorry. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Oh, great, thank you. All right, the reason I'm sharing this information is because um, one of the main things that we're doing differently this year is trying to standardize the way agencies report information. Um, so I've included that information for case management uh, and safety net. Um, the reports should include information about the number of Evanston residents served and about the number of new Evanston residents that, that uh, were seen in the calendar year. Um, for case management, you know, service plans, service plans created and number of client contacts, um, referrals and additional support services, outcomes and challenges, and then exits. Uh, very quickly, safety net services, um, in addition to the Evanston residents served, also provided information about service hours, um, the types of services and the services provided, um, whether referrals were made for deeper services within the agency or to external partners, those types of referrals and who those partners included. Um, and staff was pretty confident about asking these questions in the reports because through the application process uh, for case management, agencies provided information around 
um, their capacity to see more participants, um, their ability to create service plans and what that looked like, um, what, what was included in service plans, how often they were reviewed, um, meeting frequency with participants and, and metrics. And then for safety net services, um, they were asked about the stabilization services provided, uh, metrics, wait lists, and capacity, and then fees, if any. So I am happy to answer any questions about um, the information included in the um, report outcomes, uh, or to take good notes if I can't answer questions and, and get back to the committee with more information. Um, but again, committee members also do have access to these reports. If you know, you don't <laughs> want to take my word for it, um, but, I, but I'm happy to, to address any questions. Committee members, any questions? I'm not seeing any. Well, then I also wanted to, no, I also wanted to mention the staff report that at the last meeting, uh, members wanted more information about outcomes uh, for CARES Act funding, and that information is available in our draft 2021 caper, um, which is uh, up for review. It's in its public comment period. There's a 15-day public comment period before that report is finalized and sent to City Council for approval and ultimately to HUD. Um, the caper is quite long and a little bit cumbersome, but uh, a good read depending on what your interests are. But uh, just to sum it up, because we know it's lengthy, um, staff does include a list of narrative uh, bullet points at the back of the report. And I just wanted to bring people's attention to the five programs that were supported through CARES Act dollars. Um, those programs included a rent assistance program, a food, food assistance program, uh, the violence reduction youth program, uh, a child care scholarship program, um, and a shelter operations program. Um, and I'm happy to answer, you know, I know I'm just going over those titles very quickly. I'm happy to answer questions about any of those five programs in more detail. Do we have any questions from committee members or comments? Seeing none. Jessica, are you complete with the staff report? Yep, that is it. I will add one thing that, and that is um, the federal government um, originally was supposed to have its budget by the 18th of February, but of course they did not. And they extended it, uh, the continuing res resolution through the 11th of March. And there appears to be a likelihood that they are actually going to pass a budget by midnight on Friday, fingers crossed. Um, if they do, HUD will then have um, 45 days to <coughs> rejigger the formulas that they use for distributing these funds. Um, and then, so we would then find out what our CDBG grant is uh, and be able to figure out the public services portion of it um, in about a month and a half. Um, so we, you know, every time we turn around, it's been pushed back later, uh, but we're hoping this will actually be finalized because it will be important for us to we uh, talk about, um, you know, get a better handle on our funding so that we can um, look at, uh, we already said that because we had the additional 2020 CDBG that we reallocated to CARES Act uses that let us use it for, so, for services, that gave us that extra $124,000 in 2021. So we know we're going to have it's likely we will have less to work with in 2022. And so um, looking at how to um, continue our, uh, you know, we, we did say 
we don't have enough information to do a whole new RFP. Are we going to change things? We need to have another stable year where our, our agencies can actually really implement the process. So, but, but we hope to be um, able to work out at least, uh, we talked about perhaps making, um, if, if CDBG gets delayed any longer, making um, partial allocations with the local funds so that we give our agencies some um, surety that they're going to be funded at some level and also so we can help their cash flow. And those are things that Jessica and I will be working on for um, the next meeting. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that update. And absolutely, we'll want to continue to discuss that um, as you have more information. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, moving to the next item, public comment. I, we've received some very helpful chats throughout, um, and I do not have uh, currently anybody raising their hand to provide public comment. I'll give it one more second. And with nothing else, I believe we can adjourn only 12 minutes late. So, All right. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Be well. Good night. Bye, everybody. Have a good night.